Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate uh, Will's and Charlene's hospitality and the Sangha's presence tonight. Let's begin with the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times, please. <clears throat> Om Nam. 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 Thank you very much. The essence of Zen has no name and no form. So if we try to explain that, we would be mistaken. But if we do not try to explain that, how would you get any sense of direction, how to practice and where to go? This is the first paradox that we can encounter. And Zen loves paradoxes. As you look at your own unresolved problems, you find a lot of paradoxes inside. Paradox means that you cannot resolve it by intellectual understanding or knowledge versus the orthodox that is established knowledge used for explanations, making systems, and strategies about life and death. So the orthodox versus the paradox. And as you can see how it unfolds in your whole being, you can see where you're going. Why? Declarations, they define certain things. Questions open up these definitions. And Zen loves to ask questions. As you heard in the introductory, what is this? What is this that's using your eyes to see your ears to hear, your heart to feel, and your mind to think. And when your mind says, I, there's a label on it. In English, we say, I. In Hungarian, we would say, in. In German, ich. So, you can change these names, these labels, but this thing inside that you call yourself, you, that doesn't change so easily. Once we realize how tight this existence on this earth is, we begin to look for something. In our adult lives, we realize how impermanent we are, how interdependent we are, and how imperfect we are. These are the three marks of existence, and before long, we come to terms with them. And sometimes we sign the wrong contract, we make the wrong compromises, and our lives seem to be out of control. That is never the case. As you heard in Will's introductory, the sky is always blue, but many times we fail to notice it. In ourself, our Buddha nature is flawless, and it always functions, but we fail to use it. And once we begin to practice, we can approach it from many, many angles, but one thing we want to have is efficiency. We want to have results. We want to know we are getting to our destination. So our intellect tells us, okay, don't do anything unnecessary. Only do what's necessary. Be with the right people. Get the right teaching. Get the right teacher. And what we fail to notice that this very intellect is the source of the problem. So how can you use this to determine anything outside of this? 
And that's why Zen says, put it down. Put down your thinking, put down your dualistic habits, put down your sense of self. And at first it seems scary. And it, do I stop to exist? Well, you never really existed in the first place in the way you think you have, okay? Yes, you breathe, you eat, you sleep, you touch, you see, you hear. But your sense of existence has rather been an illusion so far. And to wake up from that, you cannot use the same machine that created that illusion. So in Zen we say, put it down. Don't make any ideas up here. Don't hold them. Don't check them. Don't attach to them. Don't identify with them. And based on these things, don't try to just want something like this little monkey grabbing for a banana. Okay? Hunters used to catch monkeys in a very smart way. They tied uh, a big bottle to a tree, and the bottle's neck was wide enough that the monkey could get the paw in, but when the monkey grabbed the banana, it was already too big for the paw to come out. And, you know, monkeys are predictable. We are too. And we don't let go of the banana. Then the hunter comes and incarcerates the monkey. So it's the same thing with existence. We have wrong views, anger, and greed. That's our banana. We love that. And with our intellect, we go after it even more efficiently than before. So what can we do? The moment you see that you've grabbed the banana and this bottle of life and death is holding you, let go of the banana without being afraid that you go hungry. You won't. There's tons of bananas outside of the bottle. And this bottle is your comfort zone. It's your like and dislike mind. And the moment you put that down, only clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's our original mind. That's what you can attain. And on the path of this attainment, we can meet many kinds of pressures. First of all, your karma can be really hot and unbearable inside. So outside pressure is a little bit smaller than the inside pressure. And you somehow have to vent. And if you do that, you sometimes say the wrong thing and act in the wrong way and release a lot of passion that can be harmful. When we say Zen means becoming one, it means you equalize this pressure without acting it out or suppressing inside. Sometimes the outside pressure is bigger and your family, your work, your spouse is putting a lot on you, okay? And then you feel inferior. Oh, oh how am I going to bear this? What am I going to do with this? And then the outside pressure is bigger. Again, you can equalize it by this attainment of clear like space, clear like mirror mind. You cannot compress space. So if you're attached to your own karma, you can be stressed. If you're not attached to your karma, your stress can be relieved. In the Orient, there were very few debates about the nature of the path. But somehow, after the 10th century AD, they started to strongly distinguish between gradual and sudden. This distinction originally is not necessary. But we make things up in our minds, so we have them. Practically speaking, when you make effort, it seems to be towards a certain direction without a certain finish line. You just go, you just practice, you just live, but you don't know when your breakthrough comes. And eventually, if you practice well enough, there are changes, sudden and gradual changes at the same time. Zen puts the bar very high. If you come for a Kongan interview, you meet the function of your intuition in a Kongan very soon. We don't care how much established knowledge you have, how much orthodoxa you have. We care for the paradox first, that we ask the right question and we pierce through the layer of the self. 
It's like putting up the roof of the house first into thin air. And you keep it there as long as necessary to build up from the foundation the whole building, the doors, the windows, the roof, the ceiling, maybe many floors, and then it connects to the roof. That's when your practice is ripe. The quote-unquote gradual systems, they have a very strong foundation, and for years they train you, teach you, hone your behavior, condition you to be a good student, and then the foundation is strong, and you go floor by floor, step by step, staircase by staircase, and then you put the roof on top. There are merits and shortcomings to each. One is that when we just demonstrate this, the point of no thinking, most people don't understand it, and they do not understand that they should not understand this, just attain this. So the foundations are mostly not there, especially in the West. Then see, what was it? Why did he hit? You know, already some question appears, which is good, but it doesn't mean that your experience and your intellectual foundations would be miraculously there in a nanosecond. That takes time. So in Zen, awakening comes first and maturing comes next, always. But none of them can go without the other. We have to understand it. Because if you put the roof of the house up into thin air, you have to have a very strong wind to keep it in place. Just like with an aircraft that has a very strong airstream to keep it in midair. I.e., you have to practice very hard to keep up that mind. And then as your practice matures, the whole building begins to appear. And if we don't practice, then this initial awakening will not have firm grounding. And that's when you can see that after two, three years, people begin to lose heart. They lose hope. They have a lot of fear. I actually didn't change much, but I've been practicing so hard, etc., etc. So the roof was there. The house didn't get built. And the whole thing starts to collapse because you don't make any effort anymore. It's gone. So once you have an initial whiff of freedom, you can really see that this is the direction. Don't hesitate. Go. Follow it. The other problem is in the other end of the scale when you do the preparations very well and your systematic studies are excellent. You're a good student. You learn. You understand. The foundations are getting very strong. And you go floor by floor door by door, room by room, up, 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 into a skyscraper. But the roof is never there. It's never finished. Because you got so good at it, okay? The preparation, sometimes you see people preparing for their meditation for 20 years. Still their teacher says, little more preparation necessary. So that's a problem because if you don't finish the house, if you don't put the roof on the whole structure, then you do not come back to the point where beginning and end meet. Where you and the world actually become one. When you finish thinking, when you finish building structures, you do not come back to this point. So the unfinished building is just as much as a problem as a roof without a house underneath, okay? And if you see it that way, you know where you are in your practice. And if you meditate consistently, like long retreats, and I really mean longer than three weeks, because that's when it really begins to cook, then you realize that sudden or gradual, they don't matter. They are categories by the intellect trying to stake out the path. But the path is actually moment to moment. Become clear. Disengage from your karma. Don't identify with your dualities. Become clear again and again and again. Solve the kongans one by one. Again and again and again. Why do I say again? Because you solve a kongan, 
teacher smiles, wonderful, and you forget. <laughs> that means your cognition played with you, catch and hide. And you have to reattain the Kongan. Imagine that. <laughs> so Kongans are these little scalpels that open up your layer of habits. And it really does change you. It puts you on the great vehicle going beyond life and death. At the beginning, I mentioned efficiency. And in order to be efficient, you have to completely put down the expectation of efficiency. Also, you cannot just straggle around and say, OK, I don't care. I practice maybe tomorrow or in a week. Someone said efficiency is not important. It is, but not in the way you think that you want results now, in a week, a month, a year, like a business plan. It's not working that way. So effort is important. Expectations ruin your practice. Very important point. So please, do not be efficient in a materialistic way that you want results in a predictable manner. Just become clear right now. Just see clearly, hear clearly, feel, think, taste, smell, touch, act clearly right now. That's all. And this effort actually changes you. The most important precondition to this change is that you are not dependent on your self-image of the past, whether it's the previous day, week, month, year, or a generation before you got married, before you bore children, etc. Do not use that self-image as a reference because that's what binds you to your past. That's what seems to perpetuate your karma. And when that's gone, you're free. Okay? And if we do that, we can use our freedom as well to help all beings. Because we don't do this practice for ourselves. Whether we talk about awakening or maturing, sudden or gradual, individual practice or group practice, we don't do this for ourselves. Please understand that. Why? Your individual liberation cannot be realized without helping other people. Why? If you don't share your freedom and attainment and helpful bodhisattva mind with them, they will come and take everything that you have. Everything. So don't let that happen. Don't let your practice isolate you, even though your qualities might be very good. Don't think that the world is samsara and I have just realized nirvana. That everybody is just a sentient being, but I, I am Buddha. Do you see the contradiction here? This I can never become Buddha. This I itself is the problem. The Buddha as an image cannot exist. And that's why in Zen we say, if you meet Buddha, kill Buddha. And Zen is one of the most compassionate spiritual paths that I have ever seen. Live with these contradictions, please. Don't try to use your logic to put an order to them. And then you will see yourself better. Your mind will always be larger than the karma that it has to reflect and contain. And if so, you'll end up better in your next incarnation than in the current one. And I think, as a prospect, it's good enough. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to listen and try and answer them. What is the meditation? Lots of theory outside about the meditation. Everyone meditate. I would like to ask you what is a meditation? When I can say I meditate, when I can say I am meditating. What are you doing right now? Sitting, talking, asking. Yeah, that's meditation when you perceive. So this perception in your clear mirror mind, what your avatar is doing, that's meditation. From a different angle, when we finally start being honest with ourselves, that's the beginning of meditation. When we are courageous enough to see, that's the beginning of meditation. When we ask one question right, without artifice, without games, without any sense of attainment, then that's meditation. The rest is technique, all right? 
Finally, you can separate the water from the cup. So, technique is necessary, it's like the cup. But we drink the water, not the cup. Deliberately, I don't talk about technique right now. I talk about the right view, the right approach, the right attitude. Technologically speaking, the West acquired the Dharma very quickly, but the usage of this Dharma leaves much to be desired. I always use the metaphor of a double-edged sword when we speak about the Dharma coming to the West. If you use it right, you can cut the jungle of your illusions before yourself. If you use it wrong, you cut yourself and you lose the path. More dualities, more ideas, stronger ego, bigger sense of self. So the Dharma is empty. It doesn't have a built-in liberation machine that takes you to nirvana on autopilot. You don't have that, luckily. Why? Because it would take away your own autonomy. It would take away everything that we hold dear in terms of self-determination or choosing your path moment to moment. So technique is a distant second and first correct view, correct attitude. And then the Dharma helps you and all beings. So when do we meditate? When we come back to this moment and we see that all karma of past, present and future unite at this moment, originate and end at this moment, that's meditation. Have your past, have your present, have your future, but never lose this moment. Otherwise your karma eats you. If not, you keep this moment clear, you digest your karma, you become free and help others become free. That simple. So when do you meditate? If you put down your I, my, me, you always meditate. And if you do some practice and yourself becomes stronger, then meditation never really happened. You use some tools to the wrong end. That's all. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your talk. From my perspective back here, you covered an, an immense amount of territory. I don't know quite how to phrase this except just saying it. Do you ever wonder if it's words, it's concepts, but it's words and concepts with very precise meanings and impacts, but how do you discern the communication going back and forth between what you're saying and what you th your perception of what we're taking in to be able to alter? And how does that work in practice? Because we're surrounded by an immense amount of books. YouTube is full of Dharma talks and all, you know, all the concepts are floating around. But I find, does that, is that really penetrating that, you know? All right. Yeah. I keep this discernment in a very simple way. I keep looking at you. And I see how much you absorb. And if your cup is too full, I stop pouring. Most important, don't fill your cup before I do. So your mind, your receptive and clear mind is most important. And if you're ready to listen, then you absorb the teaching. If we are full of our own thoughts, we cannot absorb even the bird's song. Okay? The rest is a general question about information age with zeros and ones penetrating our whole being, starting with our mobile devices and to the great server farms, you know, which we never see. It's irrelevant. Your question is relevant. But all these zeros and ones, they are irrelevant. They are creations. And the tragedy is that most human beings lose their sense of being the creator because they deal too much with the creation. Thus, they become just created by causes and conditions. And our job is to get back to the position from which we can see how we make this world with our own minds, how we create this whole thing for ourselves and each other. Now, for that, we need information, free information. So if you use all the available means to this end, you become what I call the digital ascetic. You're not inundated by unnecessary clips of movies or audio streams or TV broadcasts. You know why you're watching it. 
And yes, be entertained. Relax. But do not inundate your consciousness with unnecessary data. When you do that, you lose focus. Okay? When you've lost focus, something came between you and this world. So the digital ascetic uses the zeros and ones with caution. That's all. Do you find that the, the Zen tradition is more of a one-to-one -one transmission? Because what I hear is different than what somebody else hears. So is, it, is, the, is the message, the way of transmission, more a small person-to-person -person traditionally? Or in this age, you know, you're coming from Europe. You're, you, this is a talk we're attending, uh, you know, our contact. Understood. Yeah. So, yeah. the transmission is always from mind to mind. That's the fourth principle of Zen. But the practice is always group-based and never just individual or between teacher and student one-on-one. -on -one. Without the group, without the Sangha, we cannot attain our true nature. We would have such a strong opinion or just look for the approval of the teacher, we would be totally misled and misguided. So the teacher, the teaching, and the students group, they are equally important. And I dare say, in the West, the Sangha is more important than the other two. The other two is pretty easy to get. I mean, you can get a teacher at around the corner. Yeah. There's a lot of teachers. Dharma, if you identify the Dharma with books, which is not bad at the beginning, you can get a lot of books, online and offline. But to get a good students group like this one here, very difficult. The Sangha is the most sensitive, the most fragile, and the most important context of practicing. The Buddha himself talked about it. Can you say more about the importance of the Sangha? How? What? Is the interaction there that you're talking about? There must be oh, yeah, there interaction is. and huge, huge. And only sitting. So not only sitting, but chanting together, bowing together, doing work together. So this together action, as Zen Master Sung San used to put it, it is that community. It's a huge formative effect. Community is when it operates well. A bunch of people with various interests at the very beginning. There is no external force that makes it into a community. That's why I'm there. Only the internal commitment of people following the same rules, doing the same practice, following the same teacher or teachers. That's the internal kind of uh, web that the Sangha uses. There is no external force that holds it together. It's the individual commitment coming together with other individual commitments. All right? So that's one. That's the fabric. But in the old days, uh, as Sung San Sunim used to say, you didn't just peel potatoes one by one. You had a huge bowl of water. You dumped the potatoes in there, and you and you mixed them or stirred them with a stick. And then the potatoes, as they were floating in the water and brushed against each other, they kind of cleaned off this hard outer crust of each other. And that's the Sangha. That's the way it works. Yes. When you have your own opinion in your own bedroom and your own practice room and your own bathroom and your own car, everything is your own, your own space, your own time, your own opinion, you don't even see it. But when it brushes against other people's opinions and space and karma, then you notice it. So then there's growth, perhaps. First, no growth. Otherwise, the potatoes would get bigger and bigger uh -huh. and bigger. <laughs> First, there's the cleansing effect of putting it all down, or in fashionable terms, letting go. Letting go has a problem, because if I want to drink, I grab the cup, and I don't let go while I'm drinking. If I did, I couldn't drink. But when I want to handle the stick, I let go of the cup and I handle the stick. So putting down your own ideas, your own individual habits, your own self-image, 
that's a better term. Because then you can grab things when you need them and you have to use them and you let go of them when you don't need them and don't use them. These two go very far. Why? Attached to form means we are attached to our own sense of self, our own karma, our own ideas, an object of mind or an object of matter outside. Finally, when people get to this point, they attain emptiness. They attain no name, no form. They attain the hand that has nothing in it. The mind that has no thinking and no self. We can fall in love with that. We fail to notice that the moment we fall in love with that, it's no longer the attainment that has no duality because you got out of it, you have a relationship with it, and you embrace the image again and again and again. So we can become attached to freedom. We can become attached to emptiness because it became a thing. It became an experience. And the worst is when it becomes a self-image. I am clear. Well, if you have I, you're not clear. So this is very important. Don't be attached to form. Don't be attached to emptiness. And that's when Zen comes with this beautiful Taoist angle on nature. Then what? Sky is blue. Trees are green. Cars are passing outside. Somebody is hungry. Give that person food. Somebody is thirsty. Give that person drink. That's it. That's all that remains when you take away all that intellectual debris, all right? Uh, thank you. I'm also very interested in uh, what you're saying about Sangha and the importance of Sangha. I wonder if um, having practiced in different parts of the world, uh, y you mentioned, for example, uh, as Westerners, you know, kind of how we do with Dharma. I wonder what your what you think of um, how we do with Sangha. If it comes as if it's harder for us, if there is a certain you know yeah. we're we're very big on individualism usually as 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 Westerners, and I I just yes, just are. wonder what you see in Western sanghas I think in the different traditions. Has a huge potential to be creative, to be independent, to be conscious. So that's the kind of bright side of it. But when the same individual becomes egotistical, self-absorbed, and has a lot of anger and greed, then the same individual has these huge problems. In the Orient, traditional social structures always integrated the individual into something greater than himself or herself. Mm -hmm. The West lost that integration long time ago. Instead, there are interest groups. You join groups for various interests. And the spontaneous kind of association or the association with others for the practice of the Dharma, uh, that's pretty new. And sanghas are very fragile because you have the freedom to enter and leave at any time. Like I said earlier, only your own internal commitment can make you a genuine sangha member. That's why in our temple, in the Temple of Original Light in Hungary, we do not have membership cards. Membership means you're here. That's when you are a member. When you're not here, you're not a member. <laughs> we love you even if you're far away. But being a member means you're here. We are together, practicing, eating, talking, laughing. This is together action, and that's Sangha. I believe that uh, the spontaneous association of people practicing the Dharma by their own commitment, that's what we need to foster and help. In the West, this decision comes at a price. We have to pay with our own illusions our own expectations, our own comfort zone, which is much stronger than anything you have seen in Asia. In Asia, the individual is a distant second in the group or in the family. And that's also a problem because your creativity, your critical thinking, your own responsibility is not emphasized. Only your function in the group, in the family, that's emphasized. So you can very easily disappear as a single person, that's also a problem. 
So how do you find the middle way, the balance between the individual karma, the couple karma, the family karma, and the group karma? These are the four classes that we have on this earth. Look at yourself when you were in your teens, whether mid or late teens, it doesn't matter. But you fell in love and you fell in love so big that there was just this fire melting both of you. And that was amazing because that's the first instance when your individuality, this young and fresh crust of your ego is molten completely on fire and the other responds to it and has the same fire. So you melt together. That's couple karma. As the first experience of non-self in a totally different way than anything you can call spiritual. Somehow the other person's happiness, welfare, well-being, being not together becomes more important than me. My room, my money, my car, my, 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 my. That's totally molten in the fire of love and it has to be that way. Next big selflessness is uh, when the couple becomes family and that's one plus one equals three because you have a child. Not two anymore. So the group which is tied and bound together by their own commitments, it has a much weaker effect than couple karma or family karma because there is no blood relationship. But it has this continuous kind of melting or cleansing effect that you come together and everybody puts it down completely. No opinions, no likes and dislikes. You don't suppress your karma, also you don't vent it. You don't let it go out. We call that liberation by perception. And that's meditation. Thank you for your thoughts and teaching. You're welcome. I'm an ignorant of the philosophies of the East. I am part of a culture that is basically disappeared from this land. Wow. I am a Maya Indian. So I, I don't fit in your in the dual oh, yes, West you and do. East. I, 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 it's something completely, it's like something coming from out of space, coming and talking. To, and, uh, but there is some connection with, uh, with the cultures I mean, the, and the concepts. Uh, uh, and uh, what I wonder is this uh, the the goal in the Asian culture is is it love and what is the concept of love? Or, uh, that's my question. Well, the concept of love differs in terms of the angle that you look at it. Is it from the individual angle? What do I love? the couple who I share this love with, the family, how we have children, you know, after becoming a couple, or the group, what do we love together as individuals grouped together? I don't think that you would not fit because Zen has this very strong relationship with nature. When you mentioned Maya Indian, everybody says, wow, how can I get there? Can I be just born as a Maya Indian and I would feel better about this world than myself? Well, uh, karma is karma everywhere. There were times when the Mayans made empires and they lost them. There were times when they ruled the Andes and other mountains and they lost that. The Western mind here, we don't believe that we can lose this, but we can. The Romans never saw it coming Medieval empires in Europe never saw it coming. And unfortunately, the United States doesn't see it coming. That's the problem. Impermanence, interdependence, and imperfection, they hit us from angles we would never even suspect that they are there. Don't look for philosophies. Look for the human being. And when we are really human, we can connect in miraculous, simple, wonderful ways. When we begin a retreat, I always ask people during instructions, please leave your thinking outside of the door. Leave your religion outside of the door and leave your karma at home. And by the time you get back after a good weekend of practice, there's less of it. 
Okay, not because somebody stole it, somebody stopped making it. And then you are a better human being. Zen is wonderful because it doesn't have any preconditions. Anyone can practice. Just ask this question, what is this? Who am I? I like what is this better. It's more efficient. It doesn't have the who and the I in it. So two problems less. When we start to reflect on ourselves and we distinguish ourselves from the environment and the, the other human being, we don't lose the Garden of Eden. We start going on our path. The path of evolving as human beings. The spiritual evolution, generation after generation, that's our birthright. Just like the pursuit of happiness and individual freedoms, wonderfully laid out in the constitution of this wonderful country where I am. Don't let's lose that spiritual evolution. So that doesn't depend on any kind of creed, color of skin, language, perceived or real identity. Sounds good, huh? It's very good because your Buddha nature is the only thing that is universal. Everything else is conditioned. Everything else is individual, family or group based. Okay? So don't say you don't fit. You fit just fine. So thank you for coming. I know that you have addressed this, but I want to hear it again uh, in a more succinct kind of fashion. So my question is, what is the fabric? What is the manifestation of a mature human being? How may I help you? Succinct enough? Very, yes. No further explanation necessary. So, you know, it's very interesting that you're saying that because every time I phone Charlene, what strikes me is that on the phone she says, how can I help you? And I'm always struck by that. So you should be. Thank you. So I'm just taking up space. But we're all just taking up space. <laughs> but the space that we're taking up, what is it? I'm not sure how many cubic inches, but it's average. <laughs> I'm looking at you. It's, it's kind of all right. Not too much. Not too little. I notice we have the same size feet. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but taking the body and occupying space on this planet is a very, very courageous venture. Yes. How much space do we need? Good. How much shopping do we do? What's the mileage of our car? It's very important questions these days. So treat space with respect. And then soon you respect other people because you don't take away their space. The way you install an apartment in the West, totally different mind from the Orient. In the Orient, it's totally uncluttered. As few objects as possible because you need space for people. So the most important asset in an Oriental apartment is the floor because you can sit on it. You can have gatherings on it. You can put a table on it and then take it away. So the empty floor and empty space, nicely laid out, very clean, varnished, I mean, quality floor, that's the primary asset of a room in the Orient to the present day. In the West, you have something empty, you put objects into it right away. Armchairs, one, two, three, sofa, rocking chair, a television, many cabinets, etc. Yeah, in the Orient, they have furniture too, but distant and kind of discreetly in the background. Not so much clutter. So occupying space is okay, but being a clutter is not okay. Mm -hmm. So stay focused and stay one. When you become one, then your occupation of space is not an invasion. It's just being there. Thank you for being here. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm interested in the idea of compassion. And as we practice, you say we practice for ourselves and we practice for others. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like you to speak about compassion. 
Why do you want me to talk about something which you already have? Is your mind unsettled about it? My, my mind is interested in how one can, I don't know if I want to use the word protect, but sometimes you give... You want to use that. Okay. You want to use the word protect, I wonder if, there, if you yes. can, if you can be so compassionate that you lose yourself. In fact, yes, because compassion doesn't mean that you identify with somebody else's karma. I know you're a nurse, and I'm sure you're a wonderful nurse. But if you identify with the karma of your patients, you lose yourself. So treat them, but don't fall into the state where they are. So compassion has to pair up with wisdom. And this wisdom has distinguishing characteristics as well as the experience of oneness in it, both. So you 100% reflect uh, somebody's state of mind and state of body, and that's the basis of compassion. 100% reflection would be impossible without becoming one, but identifying with it at the same time would be a mistake. So that's where this distinguishing wisdom comes, which is non-judgmental, but it sees black as black, white as white, red as red. Very clear. How to protect compassion? Don't let anything from the inside or anyone from the outside damage it. You have to believe in it as your primary relationship to the world and other people. And when you have that, my heart to your heart, your heart to my heart, it comes like that. We are in the same space. We share the same mind. And it sounds wonderful, which it is. But the other part should also be there, that you carry your burden, I carry my burden. We can help each other, we should help each other, but you cannot exchange our karma. Your backpack is on your back. My backpack is on my back. And that's that. So wisdom and compassion together, they are very powerful. And the third part, which you have by your own choice, the selfless act to help. That's where the tripod becomes complete. Correct action, guided by wisdom and compassion. Then it's complete. In the scenario of the family, I struggle. You do too? With this. Uh, Good mother. Yes, really. Good right. mother. Don't we all? Who yes. wouldn't? <laughs> Because in my example, I'm thinking of a son who hasn't worked in a number of years and who is physically well and kids himself about what his desires and capabilities might be. Is he living at home? No, no. Good for him. No, yes. That would yes. be a major impediment. He's 50, married, child. My, my point is that what I heard you say, everybody's got to carry your own baggage, mm -hmm. you know, and yet there seems, t it, it, it's like the alternative is not to be compassionate under the circumstances, because he's not hungry and asking for food. He's not thirsty and asking for water. He's asking for nothing. And so to provide that still feels like not caring. He's asking for nothing, and you believe you need to provide that. And, yeah. And I... How does that work? That he's asking for nothing, but you still feel obligated to provide something. I... Do you see the I'd discrepancy like to help. here? Yes. You'd like to help, although he doesn't need it. Don't although waste your... he doesn't... He he would be the first one to say he needs all the help he can get. But, but does he say that? He doesn't. So don't intrude. No. Yes. Don't waste your time. Stay there with the tray of all the delicacies. But when he's hungry, he will say, Mom, please. Without that, you would be intruding. Don't. Got it. That's how we treat each other as adults. You said your son, and then you said 50, married, children. Yeah, 
He will always be your son. But a long time ago, he started to make his own choices. So be available, but don't be a burden. Hardest choice for mothers. What I find in kind of a follow-up to the, the, the whole Sangha discussion, which is really uh, interesting, it's very, uh, I'm, of course, including myself in this, it's very hard for us to perceive the value of a Sangha because I think I and we, in talking to other people, view it as my practice, my meditation, my problems, my karma, and is there, a, my, my question is, is there a way of teaching or a tradition that, I'm not trying to obliterate me, I'm here after all, but I am, is there a way of talking about it that makes us maybe realize that it's just not my practice, my isolation, my particular comment. In fact, we, there's, a, there's a very shared connection in this practice that when you start to see it, it's no longer just my practice. Yeah, there is a way to talk about it in this sense. It's called we instead of I. And that's not communism, okay? It's group <laughs> focus. We practice together. We have a view. We all see that the sky is blue and the trees are green, and nobody says that my sky is actually bluer than yours. Many times we try to impose that on one another, but talking about it in this sense is not enough. It's a good designation. From I, we have the focus on the group. Fine. But later on, we have to shift the focus back to the individual because the oscillation between them and us, me and we. So this is the oscillation that we have all the time. So when it's necessary, point at the individual. When it's necessary, point at the group. The experience will show how to keep the balance between the individual, the family, and the group. I'm just wondering how you were lucky enough to start a practice. At, I'm not sure how young you were when you... I don't know how young I was, but that was 30 years ago, so do the math. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> how I started, it really wasn't just out of interest from a newsletter. I needed help. I couldn't answer questions uh, that were deep enough to put me into crisis. Zen was wonderful to clarify why we are born, what we are supposed to do with our lives, who we are. And uh, let me just give you a metaphor. You have been to theaters possibly in your life, right? The director never appears on stage. Only the actors do. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for your true nature, who you truly are, and you find out that it's not a person, first it comes as a shock, a surprise. But also the fact that it manifests as all sentient beings, and in you it's a human being, uh, that's an experience that takes time to digest. It's uh, not uncommon that a young person cannot make choices because they all seem equal. They all seem at some point useless. And you have no reason and no meaning in your life. And if you don't have these two, you cannot make a real choice. I was rebellious enough not to accept anything that my own culture offered and I saw as impractical at best and totally dysfunctional at worst. And I am from a family of medical doctors. So I have the diagnostic view. And when I saw the Four Noble Truths, the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, the way to end suffering, I said, that's it. Thank you. I'm home. And several other experiences with actual practice, like mantra and sitting and bowing and first congas, that's a real kick in your butt. Because it really just totally jolts you out of your own comfort zone, who you think you are what you think the world is. So Zen, for me, to the present day, is enough challenge and enough reward that I would stay there, and it's undefined enough that I would not feel incarcerated by some religion or some ideology or an intellectual framework that is considered to be absolute. These things that I have listed, they are neither good nor bad, but the human attitude towards them, they make them either a prison or a house of freedom. 
Because when you consider your own thinking the only truth, when you consider your system as absolute, it loses flexibility, it loses relativity, it loses the kind of human touch, okay? It becomes a machine or some holy image or some impenetrable system. I was never interested in these or making something into an absolute image because if it's an image, it's not absolute. If it's created, it's not the creator. If it's an actor, it's on stage. But if it's the director, that never appears or disappears. It may have a chair somewhere without a name. We should remember that we brought our karma here from our previous lives. That by default defines us as long as we identify with it. If you stop identifying with your karma, that means you put your backpack right in front of yourself. Instead of being in your subconscious, your karma becomes conscious. You become aware of it. And then you can open the backpack and actually choose what kind of human being you want to be. What you want to leave in the backpack and what you want to take out. What you want to put in and to live with. That freedom, that's tremendous. Most human beings want to have a spiritual path which is like a bridge from one shore to another. But that bridge wasn't made by ourselves. And many people who step on these bridges become disappointed. They want to blow up the bridge or they jump or they just, okay, I've come this far. I take a little bolt from the bridge and I take it home. It's a spiritual souvenir of my efforts. Well, that bridge is what we call organized religions or established views or the orthodoxa, the established knowledge that we are supposed to believe without verification, without our own experience lining up with it. And then, to my perception, it's very, very different. Because we've got this backpack full of our karma, and at the first step on the riverbank, when we want to cross, we just reach in and take something out that we want to give up. It's not a sacrifice. It's just putting it all down. And then you put that into the river, and it becomes a stepping stone. And you step on it, and you grab another item of your karma that you really want to disengage from and you don't want to identify with. You drop that into the river, becomes another stepping stone, and before long you realize there are people around you doing the same thing. And you can step on each other's stones, but you can only use one from your own backpack. You cannot reach into other people's backpacks. And when does the other shore come? When the last stone is gone from your backpack. That's when the other shore appears. So it's relative. It has to come from you. It has to be personal as well as collective. And everything is built on your non-identification, on your perception, on your realization. You cannot use just other systems that were built without your own input, without your own experience. Yeah, as a start, we read a lot of books, we try a lot of things. But your path comes when it becomes really up close and personal. When you feel that the challenge and the reward are really right in front of you. That you can cover this distance, but you have to put the wall that there used to be between you and the universe down. And the same stones become the path. The difference is 90 degrees. And freedom or slavery. So that's why I'm there to the present day. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I want to sincerely appreciate your attendance tonight, your bright minds and your attention. I want to encourage uh, all of us being present here to attend regular Dharma events here in the Ordinary Zen Sangha. I want to appreciate Will's and Charlene's effort to keep this running and have true refuge for those who wish to practice. And I sincerely hope that from time to time we can come together as a Sangha, share the Dharma, and make further steps on becoming Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Thank you very much.